I think I am misinformed or made a wrong assumption about this, but in all 50 states, and I know the laws vary and they tend to follow generally the federal guidelines, is it legal for interrogators to question a minor absent a parent? In most states, that is legal. Now, most states require police when they want to question your kid to at least try to notify the parents, right? But a, a, a slim, slim minority of states require the parent to actually be there. I think only 13 states require the parent to actually be there. So in most states, you know, the police, if they come to your kid's school, they want to question your kid, they pick up the phone, they try to reach you, it goes to voicemail, they can check the box, they've satisfied their duty, and they can take your child and interrogate them without ever having actually spoken to you. So they can take a 15-year-old in, absent a parent, and absent a lawyer, if the kid doesn't request a lawyer or demand a lawyer, they can Mirandize that kid, lie to that kid about, hey, I'm going to read you your rights, but you're not in trouble here, and then interrogate a child who doesn't even understand the concept of making an admission against interest, doesn't understand what constitutes a violation of the law, doesn't understand what implicating him or herself in a crime might be, whose brain is not even almost finished growing and therefore can't predict the consequences of their actions, and interrogate that person for hours on end get a confession and say, okay, we're wrapped here, cuff them and cage them. You got it. You got it. Hundreds and hundreds of cases like that around the country where this happens, the child ends up, you know, like you say, not understanding what their rights are in the room. What kid you know understands what exactly a right to a lawyer means or what a lawyer could do for them in that moment you know, I mean, 85% of people waive their Miranda rights. And that number gets even higher when you're talking about kids. Pretty soon, you know, you got a kid who's who's being told falsely that there's a bunch of evidence against them. You've got a kid who's being told falsely that if they confess, right, they'll they'll go home. But if they don't confess, they'll go to prison. And all of a sudden, you've got a kid who is prone to saying things, saying they did things that maybe never happen at all. You see, we socialize kids to respect adults, to respect authority, to respect the police. And so they come in and say, okay, listen, here's what we know, and we're not focused on you. We just need to know what happened. And the kid may not understand conspiracy, may not understand any of the aspects or the elements of the crime, hasn't seen a jury charge ever, doesn't have any concept of what the test of the law is and can make admissions against interest without understanding what he's admitting to or she is admitting to, that just seems to me to be such an unfair playing field. Well, let me give you some good news. Um, We've had five states in the last uh, year and a half or so pass legislation that ascends are all a little different, but essentially makes these confessions uh, inadmissible with juveniles if deception is used. And and the reason I think that that's important is all the way back to 2012, the International Association of Chiefs of Police came out with a recommendation, a policy recommendation, that you shouldn't use this this tactic, lying, to our youth as a policy. And as we know, culture eats policy for breakfast. So um, we haven't seen a lot of departments implement that. But in the last few years, what we're seeing are departments take a stance on educating their investigators on how do we handle interviews with youthful uh, offenders, witnesses, suspects differently than we did before. So we're seeing legislative policy, we're seeing training being different, and we're seeing social science brought into the, to the training room. Well, when I was at Courtroom Sciences, we ran as many as 10,000 mock jurors and respondents to venue surveys, all different kinds of things in a year. And one of the things I frequently ask them is, do you believe that, generally speaking, people would admit to a crime they didn't commit? And overwhelmingly, they said absolutely not. They just cannot conceive that somebody would admit to a crime they didn't commit. 
So they have a preconceived notion that if they said they did it, they did it. People just don't admit to something they didn't do. So if you get a confession that weighs heavy on the jury, there's no question in my mind about that. But the truth of the matter is we're seeing, as you say, Laura, over and over, that that's just simply not the case. Well, the cases that'll floor you, and I think are a great illustration of your point, Dr. Phil, are these cases in which, you know, you you bring a kid, a teenager into the interrogation room, they're questioned for hours using deceptive tactics, no parent, no lawyer, kid is scared, kid offers up a story finally because he thinks that's what he needs to do, offers up a confession. Um, this has happened in Chicago all the time, actually, in a couple of cases most recently that I've worked on. Uh, the Dix Moore Five and the Englewood Four, groups of teenagers actually were brought in and confessed to murders uh, in these two separate cases. And what's amazing about these cases is that you've got kids confessing to these murders. And in both cases, before trial, the DNA evidence from the crime scene was tested. And it excluded every single one of these kids. These kids were ghosts at those crime scenes. They just weren't there. But because they had confessed in a courtroom in front of a jury, at the end of the day, they were convicted of these murders, despite DNA proving their innocence, because they'd confessed. That's how potent this evidence is. That's how powerful this belief, this myth right, is that no one would confess to a crime they didn't commit. How is that not prosecutorial misconduct? Because the jury might not understand all of the nuance of that, but the prosecutor damn sure does. The medical examiner damn sure does, and the judge certainly does. Well, I think you're right, and I think that, you know, part of what we're doing here, frankly, today And what you've been doing, Dr. Phil, on your show in covering these wrongful conviction cases is shining a light on the fact that we need to educate and reform so many different parts of this system. You know, I speak around the world about false confessions and police interrogations and wrongful convictions and juvenile justice. And turns out, you know, a lot of prosecutors don't understand about false confessions. A lot of defense attorneys don't understand about false confessions. So you got lawyers out there saying, I took a case, this kid confessed, I'm done. There's nothing I can do to help. You know, we speak to judges, we speak to police officers, uh, we speak to ordinary everyday folks who, you know, thank God get this stuff. Because once you see it, you know, once you hear these stories, once you see a video of an interrogation, you really don't have to be a lawyer to understand just how easy it would be for a kid to falsely confess. Yeah. Those the stories are what really inspired inspired me and helps us in our in our training is when you hear it directly from somebody in that position, your your question about how do you educate people on why would somebody falsely confess? It's it's about storytelling. And for the for the listeners, it's about imagining if your child was picked up for or questioned by law enforcement for anything, what would you want them to do? Right. You'd, you'd expect your child to tell the truth. And if they attempt to tell the truth, but the investigator doesn't accept it and tells them, no, that that can't be what happened, maybe lies to him and says, we have witnesses that put you at the scene or we have your fingerprints there. What would you want your child to do? And and for the people that are listening, not every child has the capacity to call mom or dad or to, or the funding to call an attorney or the maybe societal awareness that they even have one. And when you think about when we educate law enforcement, as soon as an investigator is ever questioned by internal affairs, they're asking for a union rep. Or they're asking for, you know, they're asking for representation. And so it's just put yourself in the in the mindset of the 15 year old, regardless of the crime they may or may not have committed. They're still 15 and understanding what what capacity they might actually have is important. Yeah, of course, I've had friends when I was in high school that they'd rather face the judge than their parents. <laughs> it's like, right. hey, you, know, you want to call right. your parents? No, no. Right. Put me under the jail, but don't call my dad. 